All right, greetings, everyone. This is Light of Tabor. I'm your host, Mark Rattel, and today we have a very special guest. We have Tommy Green, who is the lead singer of Holy Name. He used to be the lead singer of Sleeping Giant, and he also runs a nonprofit called Run Against Traffic, where they run marathons and raise money to help sex trafficking victims. So mm -hmm. I think that's a very cool organization. And um, thank you so much for taking the time to be here. We're really appreciative, Tommy. Yeah, thank you, Mark. I'm, I'm like honored to be here, man. Awesome. Awesome. So to kick it off, I had a, I had a couple questions written down. Yeah. I just wanted to start with like, um, how did your walk with Christ begin? What was your what was your childhood like? Like, were you were you raised in a Christian household? Mm -hmm. And um, what did your journey to Christianity look like? Maybe maybe starting back at your childhood, if we could go there. Yeah, man. Um, that's a great question. Yeah. So I grew up in a uh, my family was in two different states for most of my life. I, my um, mom and dad got divorced, I think, when I was like three or four. And oh, wow. I lived with my mom uh, for the school year. And then I would visit my dad in the summers. And so um, my mom and my dad both were Irish Catholics from San Francisco um, oh, okay. He worked for Union Pacific Railroad. And so they, we moved from the Bay Area to St. Louis, Missouri, and that's where they split. And then my mom moved back to Northern California. My dad stayed in St. Louis. And so during that, um, I think that breakup, you know, they were really young. You know, my mom uh, became a born again Christian, like a, a Baptist at this. Right. My, my grandpa, my papa, John uh basically was this like addition late um in my mom's family her her dad died when she was 17 and then my my grandma remarried uh john sinclair and he essentially just led everyone in our family to jesus <laughs> he was just like on a more he's like glory this, to god yeah baptist guy like going for it. so my mom kind of like became a born again christian um and my dad remained like an Irish Catholic and that it's like not practice. You know, it meant that you get drunk on Christmas Eve and go to midnight mass or something like I, it wasn't, right, right, it wasn't right. a part of my lifestyle with my dad. I did want my dad's approval and identity uh, to come to me. And so there were times where I wanted to become a Catholic when I was a little kid, but my mom and my stepdad, uh, she ended up getting remarried and my stepfather was a, uh, uh, music minister and, and praise leader guy and then youth pastor. So, and I didn't really relate to that. Um, right. I, think I prayed a lot of prayers when I was a little kid with them because I didn't want to go to hell. So I <laughs> right. had like a, I had a few different kind of salvation moments in, in that context when I was like maybe six or seven. And then um, to be honest, I, it's, it's hard to say, Shoot, I haven't thought about this for a while. Sorry. So I no, I, no, no worries, no worries. My stepdad went to the Golden Gate uh, Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary, which was uh, um, he got his undergrad and as a music major, and then he went to theological school in San Francisco. During that time, the best way to say it is that I was fully tormented by nightmares, and I I was like seeing a lot of dark things. Oh um, so that was kind of like, yeah, that was kind of wild. I remember feeling like this, that was a hard few years. And, and I, right. And the only way to say it is like, I almost like tried to shut down my dream life. I, I didn't want to dream. I, I wouldn't, I would try as hard as I could to stay up as late as possible because wow. I didn't have nightmares. And so I would anyway, so I just remember in that time, I just, I, I just didn't get their God stuff. I wasn't there, but I, there was a very good chance that I was also being kind of pressed on spiritually as a young kid too. But you know, you don't have any grid for that. I just thought I was getting bullied and beat up at school and having nightmares all the time. And like, that's right. Just right. It was. And then I would go and visit my dad in St. Louis and um, it, there wasn't the same kind of like religious pressure. And so I just didn't, I didn't mess with it. I didn't, I didn't respond to it. I didn't like it. And so pretty early on in my adolescence, um, seventh, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, I was, I was beginning to do a lot of drugs and run away and, and just kind of like, didn't, didn't identify with what right. they were doing at all. So very much <laughs> sounds so like 
oh, 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 but I was just a preacher's kid, really, I guess is how that works. I was just like, 40. yeah. Well, I see a lot. I see that happen a lot with preachers, kids that I mean, like an extra rebellious stage. I mean, oh. I grew up in in a, a Roman Catholic household and went to Roman Catholic school and I mm. rebelled and, and repelled from that, like super hard in my teenage years. And I feel like there's there's some similarities in that in that regard. Let yes. me I'm going to close my I'm going to close my door really quick because I got the kiddos right out there. I'll be right. I'm, yeah. No problem. Hey, Mark, thanks for having me on the podcast. <laughs> All right. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. But that's really interesting. Yeah, I, I was raised Roman Catholic myself. And my daughter right now is, is having um, issues with night terrors. So I was wow. actually watching. Yeah, I was actually watching. Um, I think it was. I can't remember the, the name of the podcast, but it's one. It's the one with Father Turbo and two other gentlemen. And Father oh. Turbo was giving advice on how to combat night terrors and demonic attacks in the middle of the night. And he was talking about drinking holy water before bed. And then um, saying, I think, I believe it was Psalm 68, let God arise and let his enemies be smited. Yes. And, and, and uh, yeah, he was saying, say that and then bless the, the bed and uh, with the holy water as well. And I've been, I, I wrote that down and I've been trying to do that. It's been helping, but it's still a, there's still a battle for sure. But I've noticed when I pray and when I engage in these things and give her some holy water before bed, there's definitely a, a difference, a big difference. That's powerful. Yeah. I, I, to me, I, um, I shut down my dream life. I began to lie. Also right. shout out father turbo, the Royal path. That's a good, that's, yes, that's still, exactly. Yeah. He's called me a handful of times. I've, I've just talked with him a few times. He's been such an encouragement and, um, yeah, I have such deep respect for him. I really appreciate him. <laughs> kind of yeah, he's awesome. Time. So kind. Um, yeah, the I, I just started lying to people and telling them that I could dream about whatever I wanted. Right. Because I just shut it down. I'm going to say this. It's not fully, it's not at all, I don't think, an orthodox perspective. But right. in my journey as a like charismatic Christian guy, when I, when I actually kind of surrendered my life to Christ and got like saved and serious for real. Um, right. I immediately began dreaming again. Oh, wow. And it was That's interesting. Wild. Yeah. And I did, I didn't have a context for it. And then I, you know, you read the Bible, it's like a third of the Bible is dreams and visions. So I was like, what is going on? Like that language, let's say like in Joel, you know, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams. Like, right. There's this thing of like, God uses, I mean, he, he saved our Lord, you know, by speaking to Joseph, however many times. So it was just interesting because it, it really is an avenue. I wonder if like in um, the song of Solomon and I slept, but my heart was awake. Like, I just wonder if the Lord tries to keep that a holy space for us as kids and people, because it's when you get attacked in the night, it's like, it's so, it's scary. It's so scary. And it was so, I was so fearful um, of the dark and of whatever it was that I felt like I could feel and sense. Um, right. and that's just a very, it's a very interesting thing to be a more like kind of charismatic dude. But I just remember that my dream life came online when I surrendered my life to Christ again. And it was so, it was like, he, he cleansed that channel and all of a right. sudden there was one more way where I felt like he instructed me that was it. But yeah, so I, I grew up in a, in a Christian home, but I rebelled from it. And then my, um, that was my family life. I, I, I dipped out uh, my junior year. I ran away. My junior year moved in with my girlfriend and graduated high school um, that way. And so I just, I really fully rejected their whole thing. And then by the grace of God, a bunch of my friends from the hardcore scene here in Salt Lake city, uh, a bunch of people came out from Southern California and it was a band on tour that was called No Innocent Victim. And a bunch of the dudes from No Innocent Victim came out to play a show in Salt Lake. A bunch of my friends knew them. And so I ended up making friends with these guys. And the best way to say it was the, the spirit of Christ, that safety, that there was a there was an atmosphere of, of I don't, you know, just righteousness or something. But it felt yeah. familiar to me. I just felt like, yo, these guys are into everything I'm into, but it feels like when I'm at my parents' house, like it feels, it felt familiar to me in that way. And so anyway, so I ended up becoming friends with them. I ended up moving to Southern California and um, right. my, life, cool. my life kind of blew up after I moved out there. And that's that season that kind of brought me to 
the end of myself fully. And um, I gave my heart to Christ and be, became like a, a young Christian that started a Bible study because I just, I nice. didn't go to church. I, I didn't go to church anywhere. My friends had gone and there had been like a church split. And so they didn't right. go back. So I had all yeah. these Christian friends and we weren't going anywhere and they knew Jesus and I kind of didn't. And then I got kind of like radically saved or whatever and was just like, why aren't you guys telling everybody like we got to do this? So then I started like a Bible study for kids in our culture and that turned into a few different church groups. And so for many years now, Chrissy Green, my beloved Chrissy Green, we, we've just been leading we were leading small home churches and regular Bible studies and groups kind of all over the planet. Um, nice. Until a couple years ago, um, really. Wow. So that was kind of my journey was uh, a dude that was not a Christian. And then when I got saved, it was almost like the, the, the gift that I offered to the Lord. Right. I was just like, I've used my mouth for all the wrong things. I will yeah. only be about you. And in the best of my ability, that's kind of how, the the first church we planted was called Tithemi Outreach, and it was in Redlands. And then I we were holding shows, hard show, hardcore shows, punk rock shows in the venue. Now was this it was this around the time that Sleeping Giant came to be? Yeah, yeah like I was just preaching, and I hadn't been in a band for a little while. I, I played drums in a band, and we were putting on shows all the time. And then right. the, the dudes in the band said, "You haven't sang in a band for a long time." we want to do a band. Would you sing? And I said, yeah, I'm only going to talk about the Lord though. That's all I care about. And they said, that's fine. Right, and so dude. we just did that. And it was very much a side project. It was not meant to be a thing. And then, um, uh, sounds it, like it kind of became a thing. huh? It just started gaining all this momentum. And, and I'll say this. And again, it's like, you know, open-handed, you know, please forgive me if this is like way off, but I started having dreams of being in Salt Lake city. Yeah. And I, I started having almost like dreams of my daughter. My oldest daughter was, was with, I was with her mother. We, we got divorced when I was in California and right. I had these dreams of uh, my, my oldest daughter leaving away from me and I couldn't get her. And then I would end up in this like weird cavernous kind of place. And then I'd end up on state street in Salt Lake. And I'm like, well, Salt Lake city, like what's going on. And within a couple of months of that, I had a meeting with my ex-wife and she's like, I'm moving back to Utah. I'm taking Marin. And wow. so, it was like, I just started pastoring the church. I've been doing that for like a year and I was yeah. like, no, 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 no. So I ended up getting a job with a bank, um, in California. So I could transfer out here. Um, I was dating Chrissy green at that point. And so I was like, you got to come with me. It'd been a few years since, um, I'd gone through everything. And so I was like, you need to come. And so I, I proposed to her and then I was a banker, dad guy, pastor guy, and then moved out to salt Lake. And, uh, we kind of kept going to ministry. And so I was a banker during the week. And then on the weekend, I would fly back to Salt Lake City and we'd play some weird metal show with Sleeping right. Giant. And then it got to a point where they were like, we need to do a tour. And I was like, I don't see how that's supposed to work. And so I, I anyways, I ended up quitting the job at the bank and we started doing Sleeping Giant full time. Nice. And ministry and the band full time. And that's kind of, that's kind of where I was. And that sort of took me through 2000 and, you know, 2007, 2008, up to 2000 and uh, like 18 is when a lot of stuff started changing for me. So very cool, very cool. Yeah, I mean, I can definitely relate to an extent on the dream thing. Growing up, coming from a background where I smoked a lot of weed, and yeah, I mean yeah. that would totally take away my dreams. My dreams were gone. My dream life was gone, and and you know this this can happen with alcoholism as well. Yeah. And I was listening to someone talking about this, how like when your dream life totally disappears, it starts bleeding into your conscious reality and, and, it, oh. and it bleeds in in the form of delirium. And it's mm -hmm. like your, your, your dream life is because it's such a ne necessary part of our development and part of everything that, that we wow. and I do believe God speaks to us through dreams and, and uh, can send prophetic messages through dreams. I, I, I believe that even people outside of orthodoxy, miracles happen all the time all over the world. Yeah. with with all types of people and i believe god works through these situations to to in, in, in want to to lead us closer to him to lead mm -hmm. us closer to the truth and and wow. i believe he works through all different cultures and all different i mean it's it, you could see it everywhere you could see it in your testimony you know and i mean these things when they line up like that that's not just a, a random occurrence that's god's providence i don't think so either and i i mean for being in the kind of the the, the larger sort of Protestant world and going all over the world with the band and 
we ministered in a, I mean, we were super out there. So we went to um, like Burning Man and we would do dream interpretation and prophetic messages for people. We pray for people. I watch people get saved on the playa at Burning Man and, and they, they get knocked, That's intense. Out, knocked out under the presence of God, come up and they are saying Jesus and we never said it. So wow. like, I've seen wild, like man, you know, saving people at burning man, that must've been intense, dude. Oh my goodness. But that's powerful to go into that environment with, with, with the Holy, with Christ and, and to bring people to Christ in that environment. How powerful is that? I, that's just so cool. I never knew that was happening. Yeah. That's again, Jesus is the prophet and the priest and the King. And so I, like he says, yeah. this little seed, it's gonna get everywhere. And so, you know, <clears throat> it's super weird. And I, I'm yeah. like, I don't, I caution people like, yo, it's not for the, go with very mature people because, and you have to be in the right frame of mind and it's spiritual warfare for sure. Yeah, but I just, I, I'd seen enough to know that there's all these people that are outside of the church and God is speaking and they're like having these visions. There was a, a dream I did for a guy. I remember he came to me and he said, I keep having this dream. I've had this reoccurring dream for like the past X amount of years. I'm in my room. There's a sliding glass door and there's a lion on the other side of the glass door. And I'm just looking at the lion and the lion is looking at me. And he's like, and then I pop out of the dream. He was a oh. director. It was, at, it was actually at Sundance. It was at the film festival. Oh, wow. Like, and so I'm looking at this guy. I'm on main street in park city. And he's telling me this and, and he says, I have this dream, you know, and there's this lion. Well, like if you were to take biblical dreams from the Bible, Joseph's dreams and run them through Jungian archetypes or normal new age dream books, you wouldn't get that interpretation. So obviously the Holy Spirit can interpret dreams better than anyone. So this guy does his thing. And what I have in my heart for him is like, oh, and he goes, dude, it's just like so terrifying. And I was like, oh, OK, um, I think you need to let the lion in. And he's like, what? And I'm like, well, they call Jesus the lion of the tribe of Judah. And I think exactly. that exactly gives you the creativity. And I think you need to open that door and let him in. And so it's just very wild that like these people have these dreams. Somehow this imagery makes its way to people's lives. And he was he's weeping and it's like a whole anyway. So I've just seen enough to know that um, it is that mysterious realm of like, it's just let God be God. And I, I, I don't know how it all shakes out, but I have seen that. So that was, that was like a big deal for me was I had experiences with God when I got saved and I was in a community of Christians in Southern California that did not believe in experiences at all. Right. And so very interesting, like going on that journey and going, no, no, but it's like a real relationship. You said like he, he should be able to communicate with, with you in your heart. And I was really just trying to figure it out. But uh, in yeah. the midst of that season, I remember um, I met a guy and he said, uh, we were at a community of men. It was a healing, kind of an inner healing, heart work, you know, banging drums in the woods, kind of like, you know, men's retreat thing. Yeah, and, yeah. There's a lot of those. I was, trying right to, I was trying to get my heart and mind kind of healed up after everything I'd gone through with my divorce and stuff. I really just was trying to almost like be healthier before I proposed to Chrissy. And so I'd gone through these right. weeks trying to get my junk out there like hey man i don't want to bring a bunch of baggage into my relationship and you know anyway so this guy yeah. met me and he said uh he sat down with me and he said uh i really loved your heart i love you know the way that you talked about your conviction in the lord and i know that you said you were like a preacher at a, a church and all this stuff and he said um what's the point of christianity and i was like to become like christ and he goes yeah, dude. De deification. And I'm like, what? And he goes, do you know the name of the woman at the well? And I was like, no. And he goes, I do. And I know where her church is. And I was like, what? And he goes, I just want you to entertain the possibility that you may not have the whole story about what's going on in the church. And I was like, and so he was this dude. It was probably a year it and a sounded half. Like, it sounds like theosis. Dude, he was an Orthodox guy. And he kept uh. <laughs> and I was like, what? Like, I just, I, he was this plumber guy. And he's like, and I started in a more charismatic background. When I got married to my wife, we did this huge, like, prophetic dance and stuff. And he's like, he's like, and that was like 25 years ago. And he said, in about however many years, I can't remember. I don't want to, I don't want to say it wrong. But 
at a certain point, he, his wife, his family, they became part of the Orthodox church. And I had no idea what he was talking about. And this is wow. probably 2000 and, 2005. And he, he told me this and wow. I was just like, Oh man, I mean, that's great. That sounds so cool. I just, you know, I love, if they're going to take Christ serious, I'm just like, yo, we're on the same, same gang. Like, that's awesome. So right. I didn't, I didn't want to do what he was in. He was like, I really want you to explore and come. And I was like, no, I don't think I can do that. So right, right. it's wild to go through now it's, you know, 13 years later, I've been doing ministry and have done, have ministered, have preached what, you know, have preached the gospel all over the world. And by, by the standards of the modern church, you know, I've seen hundreds and thousands of people give their hearts to Christ. And it's like, I've done the thing. Um, and then we went through such a wild season of personal loss that I realized that it just broke me down completely. And, and a lot of the answers that I thought I had, they didn't work. And then I really realized that it, I had done a whole lot of things. It's, it's like the verse in the song of Solomon is what I say. Like she says, the Shulamite says, you know, my brothers made me keepers, keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. And so it's almost wow. like I, I just realized when everything blew apart, there was faithfulness in here. There was a, there was a sense of perseverance. There was something, but I, I, I was barren. Like, I just felt, dude, like, I don't think I'm holy at all. I don't think any, I don't know if anything has gotten in here at all. And uh, right. that's what kind of put me on the search of like, I got to figure out if any of this stuff I've been raw rawing about is real or I am out because I've been this cheerleader for a culture. And I don't know if I back the culture anymore. So, oh my God, like, what do I do? And that, and, and that was that first little breadcrumb of, wait a minute, that dude told me that there was a whole history that I knew nothing about. Like, what was that again? And it, it, right. I, could almost bread, I could almost breadcrumb my way to the beckoning of the Lord. Like there's more, or there's something beautiful for you to discover here. Um, but that's, that's just interesting that it was in Redlands and kind of starting ministry that I was almost like interrupted by this dude who was like, Hey man, I love you. And I love your passion. I can feel it. I know where you are. I was where you are. Would you consider? And I, I considered, but it was not, I just wasn't interested then. It was like, not a thing. Did um, it seem like too, I, did it seem like out of reach and foreign at the time? I wasn't a religion dude. I was like, right. -religion. I was anti-structure. Right. I was, uh, it's, I am like, we are the temple of God and we are the, it's personal. It was this rugged individual I got you. thing. And, and in a lot of ways, I was also fighting with Christians to have a personal relationship. And so I was just like, obviously yeah. I'm on the right track. Cause everyone says I'm like crazy, but I just right. think <laughs> if it's a personal relationship, he should personally have a relationship with me. And so right. I'm telling my friend at the time, one of my best friends, um, I just want to be tight enough with the Lord that if I asked him, God, how are you today? He would tell me. And he's like, that's the stupidest thing I've ever. So I just, I felt like, no, man, there's, a, there's a thing we got to do, you know? And, and really all I wanted was I wanted, a, I wanted him to communicate to my conscience. I, I wanted to be connected with him. I wanted union with him. I didn't care. But I felt like, you know, I'm punk rock. So like, everyone's like, no, no. And I'm like, well, screw you, buddy. I'm going anyway. Like, it was just like my own, you know, whatever that was. So I think about that a lot. And when I first started talking with um, Father Patrick at um, Holy Trinity out here, I told him that story. And he was like, what's that guy's name? And I'm like, if you paid me a million dollars, I couldn't remember. Like the I, guy who planted the seed originally? Uh, and he was just this plumber or like electrician guy from Southern California that right. was like, I know you're like charismatic world. And, um, it, it, at a certain point, it was not, it was not fulfilling really what was going on with me. And I discovered there was this higher call. And honestly, the, the practice, the truth of theosis and the reality of the, the incarnation of God, the incarnation of Christ, those two truths I think helped save my soul because I was like, literally like I'm, I'm out. And unless I can see that this is, there's actually was a plan that makes sense at the beginning. This is just right. us picking this up for our own benefit, our own power, our own ego, our own control. If this, if this is not true at the beginning, 
it doesn't work. I don't care if it works yeah. for you. It's not true. I'm out. Like, and to go all the way back to the beginning and realize that there was this simple yet profound, the theanthropos, the fact that the God man, like that is nutty. Like there is riches for your life there. And I was like, Oh, that is enough. That's crazy. And then to discover that there was this process, this, the exchange, that participation in the divine nature of God that we all kind of want, but it was like spelled out. And I'm like, Yes. Why, did we, why did we make it so crazy? Like what? Do, so that was kind of, yeah. like, huh, I, I get that. And I, and my wife at the time had been uh, a yoga teacher for like seven, eight years. And so, Oh, wow. I did. I, I did yoga for like uh 10 years. Kundalini yoga. Dude. Well, Chrissy was more just the fit. It was hot yoga, but it was like power. I gotcha. It was just more fitness for her. And we were like Jesus people that worked with new AG people. So we were like, yeah, we don't care. She actually did right. a thing at a spot called Holy Yoga 2, just for um, moms. It was like pregnant yoga. She did a training with a Christian just to try to see what they were saying. Because she's like, I don't know. Like, I like the idea of bringing Christ with us. But like, you know, who cares? Anyway, so she yeah. was doing but the language around yoga is like, it's your practice. You're deepening your practice. You show up every day to do your yoga. And that's your practice. And I'm like, how do they have a clearer process of where right. they're going. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's true though. But that idea of there's actually progression and we would, and you know what I've heard other Orthodox teachers say is as you walk with the Lord in the cool of the evening, you, you are transformed in, in this participation with God. It, it's just slow and steady. Thing. Maybe you're never going to get there and then death's yeah. going to kiss you and transform you finally. And you're like, Hey, but like just that idea of, it was so much like cleaner to me somehow than we got to do more Bible study. We got to worship through the night. We got to do all this. It's like, it's just chaotic. And then there's this process of these simple kind of sacramental life and this, this disciplined focus of praxis, this it's a practice. If you practice yeah. this discipleship, but it feels like in the world I came from, there's no plan. It's just like crap shoot spirituality. And yeah, I, I just, it was very destructive. At the end of the day, it was, it did a lot of harm to me. I didn't realize until later. And so anyways, that's kind of a, a little tidbit of like, that's kind of how I ended up where I am. I can think back on different conversations and I'm like, man, Lord, did you leave me here? Cause it, it feels crazy, but that's kind of what, yeah, to this point. Yeah. It almost feels like, how did I get here? You know, but it's like, and it's, it's so beautiful. The orthodoxy, the way the, the the holistic understanding and the untainted truth and bringing it back to the origin and the history, the church history and the, and the practice of blending the physics. It's like the physicality, you know, you do these physical, the sign of the cross and the prostrations and, 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 and it, it bringing the faithfulness like closer into your heart through these practices. It's like, it's, it's this, spirituality and physicality all in one all encompassed in it and it all goes together and 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 feeds into the faith and and it shifts your heart over time attending the divine liturgy you know Mm -hmm. saying the morning prayers um all these things evening prayers with the children around the a prayer corner the icon corner like just setting up an icon corner having an icon corner in the home and just uh all these beautiful beautiful deep rich practices that um, I never experienced in any other aspect of, of Christianity because I, I grew up Catholic. I grew up Roman Catholic, you know, yeah. and, and um, I went I went from that. I was disillusioned with that. I knew there was something missing and, and something wasn't just wasn't adding up. A lot of my questions were not answered and, and they were trying to deter me from ans- a- asking questions. And I've noticed in orthodoxy, it's the exact opposite. They love mm-hmm. your questions. They love you inquiring deeper and they, and they, and they may not have an answer for everything, but I mean, it's pretty dang close until you get into like the mysteries, you know, there's this, yeah. then there's this embracing of the mystical aspect, which is, which is so beautiful. beautiful. <laughs> right. It's so, it's I mean, that's my fave. I think that I, I like love it because Chrissy Green and me would talk in our old, kind of in our old, walk like as leaders we would talk about holistic discipleship like and we would reference that jesus was the word made flesh and like even with what we do with our nonprofit, i i we had a 5k run in texas with a bunch of realtors like uh in nice Dallas nice last year 
And I was right. there, and I'm, I'm speaking before we did the 5K, and I said, for me, this is, you know, I'm a, I'm a Jesus magic guy, and people laugh, you know, I'm trying to, you know, not be heavy handed about it, but I'm like, but for me, it says in the word of God that, that Jesus was the word of God who, who became flesh and lived. And I think if people don't have a way to embody what they love and what they're about, we live, uh, shut down somehow. And so I, my, my friend out here, Aaron, um, he had a dude, I'm going to say, so I'm not, I wasn't, I'm not even, I am I was right at the beginning of my journey. He became a Christian in my living room in California, like 15 years ago, then became like a Muslim, then was like nothing. And then has been going back to like Catholic mass. So he's like, bored with Catholic mass. So he has a dream where his grandmother comes to him in the dream and says, you need to go talk to Tommy. I'm I'm in the barber shop getting my hair cut by my homie Zach. And I'm just, I'm still disillusioned. This journey into Holy Orthodoxy started from such a deep place of pain. There was a lot of, there was a lot of heat, man. I was, I was not in a healthy place, but I, I think I was aiming the right direction, but man, I was just, I was pissed and I was not in a good spot. So he comes in, he's like, he's kind of like an MC, like rapper guy, you know? Oh, nice. I love, I love hip hop. I used to MC a little bit myself. Yeah. He's, you'd really, he's incredible. He was like one of my favorite MCs from here. And anyway, so he's like, Tom, man, you doing a church, man? And I was like, no, why? And he goes, cause you're usually like kind of on the cutting edge. And my homie, Zach, who is not a believer and I talk to all the time. He's like counsel to me. He's like a truth teller. He'll set me straight. He's just, he's been a dear friend for a long time. He starts laughing. He's like, this dude is not even on the cutting edge of anything. He's been like a thousand years into the past. And I'm like, oh. So I start laughing and um, Aaron's like, what? And I'm like, dude, I've actually been going to the uh, Greek Orthodox church down the street. And he goes, dude, my stepdad's Orthodox. What I'm, I'm just like trying to figure out what to do. Now this is me and this is like, forgive me when we were helping the first survivors that we helped out of the trafficking space were in um, France and it was actually a Catholic priest that ended up assaulting and and raping one of them repeatedly. And she got so sick that she ended up passing away. Oh man. Lord have mercy. I mean, for real, it's like, it still hurts. Like it's what put us on the journey of like trying to create better aftercare if you rescue them there's nowhere for them to go there's not enough places so it's it's really cool to be like we rescue people where are they gonna go like the reality of it yeah the after yeah the aftercare is the problem that we fell in love with because of what we experienced and so it's interesting because my my so when i my my own faith begins to collapse i go i need to discover the origins of the church and as for my family background the oldest church I knew was the Catholic church. Like that was, what, and I'm like, and I will not mess with them because exactly fundamentally the way that they've approached celibacy and they, and I just thought, Nope, Nope. Where do I go? And then boom, I I started having these memories of some of these conversations and I'm like, Oh dude, I wonder if that was before. And then I discovered that it was orthodoxy a thousand years before. And I'm like, exactly. There's room for me to discover. And then I find out their priests can be married. And I'm like, yeah, that's dude. I think, I think that has to do with the problem that the, with the, with the abuse in the church, because I think, um, I don't know the suppression of, of those urges. It it comes out in a, in an unnatural way. And I do believe priests should be able to marry. Yeah. And, 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 I think it's Peter, a healthier, a way healthier way of going about it. Peter had a wife. For crying yeah, out. Anyway, so it's exactly. Like, so I, but I, so my friend says, dude, I don't know what to do. I don't really want to. And I'm, and this is me completely out of line. So like anyone that hears this, please forgive me. But I just said, you ought to go to a church where they let their priests get married. So they don't mess with little kids. Yeah. And he looked at me and goes, it's yeah. real. So now him and his son are catechumens. I think they're going to get baptized at this Orthodox spot. Glory to God, like, man. Glory oh. to God. That's so that's awesome. How, that's kind of how that happened. I was like, what? He told me, he's like, yeah, my grandma gave me a dream that I was supposed to ask you. And I was not even wow. fully involved. I just, I was reading and having conversations with the priest and just trying to feel out if I was crazy or not. And in the meantime, I'm like, but dude, I, so anyways, so it's been interesting dude. having those conversations, but I, I just remember thinking now. I started with all of this like intense 
disillusionment and anger. And I think there's a whole lot of people in our culture that are walking away from different structures because they're looking for the truth. And, and yeah. I, for me, I started, you know, I was frustrated. Angry, right? Yeah. I got about four months into this, the discovery and reading and realized just how sick I was feeling on the inside. And, and I, this was before I bought the book even, I can't, uh, but I, I just told Chrissy, I said, babe, I, I'm not, and she didn't really know what I was doing. She, she was like watching me and she's got my back, but she was like, yeah. I don't, we fought in our own Christianity to get free of a lot of the fear and a lot of the stuff. And so she's like, I don't want to put on religious stuff and have that be this like weight. And I'm like, right. I totally get it. I just, I'm literally just trying to figure out where I am. And so I had a very just, similar experience coming into orthodoxy at the beginning with my wife. It was, and yeah. a lot of men do I've noticed. I, I think it's, I mean, I'm, I'm grateful for them, for the individual, anybody that's going to say, cause Chrissy Green's like life verse. One of her life verses when I met her was from the song of Solomon. And it's, and she says, um, until the, uh, the daybreak and the shadows, flee, I will go my way to the hill of frankincense and to the mountain of, it's like, I will go through the suffering. Yeah. I will go to the heights. I will endure. And she told me when we first started dating, she's like, if you ever stop following the Lord, I'm not. And so I'm like, and I love you and you're a gangster. That's that's awesome. like, so I knew her conviction towards the Lord, but we had both been really shattered. And so I was kind of in this unique spot. She's looking at me like, I know you and what are you doing? <laughs> you know? And so yeah. and to that conversation, um, I'm four or five months in, I'm having conversations with father Patrick. He would come over and talk with me and Chrissy and we would just chop it up, man. And he, he was so healing and wonderful to us in that. Um, but I told her about four months in before we went through like a, a class, like a full class with him. Um, I just said, I, I started this because I was pissed. I need to sit almost where there's beauty. Like I'm, I'm like, I wish I could just go to the mountains or something. Cause I, I feel so sick by all the ugliness and I, I just, I just need to be healed. And I said, I, I only want to continue on this journey if it's a more beautiful way. I'm not going to be mad anymore. I, 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 that is and not what a, what a beautiful journey. Orthodoxy is though. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, <laughs> so it's been Seriously. so wild. Every time I bump into it, almost, I'd be, I'd, I'd be like cagey. And if I'd go, I'd go to a divine liturgy, I would have a conversation. I'd go to the class, I'd read another book. And it was like, anytime I would like bump into it, kind of like at arm's length, like, don't hurt me. <laughs> yeah. I was yeah. blown away at, at, it was, there was so much beauty. And so that's ultimately, I think for me and Chrissy, both and our family, like, that's the thing that I slowed down and chilled out. And then we just sort of slowly are walking and I'm just feeling the beauty of God and I'm, I'm unlearning a lot, I think in the process and I'm just kind of like chilling. So I, I that's what I'd say is like, I, I came from that disillusioned place. I think a lot of people are, but it's that calm and the, and the, and the peace and the, and the beauty of the Lord, um, that holiness that's so beautiful. That's the thing that I think really wants to settle into our hearts in this sort of transcendent journey. Like that's where we're going. So that's kind of what brought me to where I am now, even with the nice. Holy Name project and everything was like, I had to get through that. And I, I wanted to fight my way through it. And I kind of had to just what surrender my way through it or repent. Right. 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 So, right. Kind of the journey, Mark. Awesome. Awesome. And then I, if you don't mind, I would like, if you, if you don't mind, I kind of want to back up a little bit yeah. in it. If you could go deeper into if if you don't if you're if you're comfortable with it, what the um what the grief was exactly? Because I think you had multiple. Oh, I don't yeah, know if it was yeah. it was I, deaths around you that you that you yeah. um experienced that led you into this place where you were really just kind of deeply searching and questioning everything and and what exactly happened there. Yeah, yeah. So there was two things. One was profoundly personal. One okay. was completely about Christianity as I knew it. So one of them one of the sequences of events that happened was we lost our first survivor person. We got her free and clear from that organization. And she was so sick that she passed away. That's 2016. So God we get contacted by a second survivor that was with the first one in the midst of 2017. We get her out and into rehab. 
she ends up falling for a 30 year old dude at the rehab. He ends up dipping with her and we wow. were telling her you're going to, he's going to put you out again. Like you, you can't do this. And so 26, 2015, 2016 is super intense on the trafficking thing. I don't ever really put that on this list, but I need to, cause it was, it just began to collapse a little bit right. <clears throat> in, in 2017. You know, we're fighting for this second girl. I'm, I'm not sure what's happening. You know, it just, it went real bad. Again, everything fell apart in the aftercare. Um, right. 2018, my first band plays its final show. And then my younger brother, Connor, who is like one of my best friends, he just died really suddenly in Boston. And I, I flew through the night to pray for him. I was fully like, I'm praying for him and I will, we will wake him up. Like, this is not okay with me. This feels like horrible there makes no sense. Like anyway, so I, so he passed away in uh, May of 2018. Um, a month later, Christy and I had our first of four miscarriages. Oh man. Lord have mercy, dude. It was, that's intense. It was, it was, so the first one was just, you know, and we're like baby people. Like uh, I, it was, she, Christy was like, I've never, we never had that happen before. Cause we've had three of our own. And then my oldest Marin is uh, 22. And so, wow. you know, she was a stepmom and we got together and then we've had three of our own and we've never had an experience where it didn't work. Right. Like where it didn't go the way that you thought, you know? And yeah. so she said, I, I think we were all still so stressed and freaked out about my brother that she said she almost didn't even feel pregnant. Like she didn't even almost know. And so we're like, man, I wonder if it was just the stress of the world and, and life and man, that sucks. And I'm so sorry. Are you okay? And she's like, honestly, it felt like a, a pregnancy before it fully almost felt like it was a baby. Like mentally she didn't have a lot of trauma around that. It just sucked. It was like, Oh, we get pregnant uh, a handful of months later um, with my son. And he, he, he was great. Like he was doing great. And, and he was, uh, he was perfect and healthy. And I got a video of him moving around and the nurses are all stoked for us. And they're like, Oh my God, he's great. And at 18 weeks, um, he just, he was gone. Oh man. And we had done the like announcement in my backyard. Like we waited through everything after that miss, you know, we're like, we're going to go through 12 weeks or so. We're not going to tell anybody. We had our yeah. intercessory friends, like just praying for us. And then I had my family back over and I'm like, you know, they, if hell tries to take a green, we're going to make a green. Like we're going to, you know, there's going to be a green boy. Like, woo. And we did the cannons and everyone's stoked. And then a week later he's gone. Lord and, have mercy, man. And I, that was, the, it was my brother and my son. His name is Riggins. It was my, it was Connor and Riggs. And that I was like, what is going on? Um, it happened again. We got, we got pregnant within that year. We got pregnant with a little girl and her name is Phoebe. And she, we lost her at 16 weeks. Um, and then uh, right around that time, my wife's mother, Sherry, passed away. Um, and the same weekend, my uncle Johnny in St. Louis died. Man. And then, like three months later, we had a little nephew in, in California that passed away really tragically as well. And so Dude. in the midst, that's the personal stuff. I was yeah. also serving up until 2017 at a Bible college. And, right. and it, was, it was an online Bible college. I was the third year evangelistic mentor. So I was training up evangelists and the leader of that school was found out to be, um, massively damaged psychologically, like legitimately and was grooming me members of his female staff. Oh, um, so we had to fight our butts off to shut the school down. Um, but watching that happen in my old Christian context, watching the leaders of that movement come in and essentially only really care about the dude that was preaching um, and seeing him restored um, yeah. was, was like sickening to me. I've seen, a, I've seen a lot of that in Protestantism in uh, what's this, this, it's this like culture of personality. These kind of, these people get built up and, and, and idolized and um, yeah. It, it it becomes this this thing where I, I've seen yeah and, and, and I was attending a church right before I came to Orthodoxy. It was a non denominational. I'm not going to put it on blast or anything. But there was 
a scandal right before we came in, apparently. And the, and the main priest took himself out of the spot and put another family member in the, in the position, but he was still running everything behind the scenes. Yeah. And it's like, and it, and when I got deeper, I always, when I get into a church, I always like to be involved. I always like to be involved behind the scenes. I like to contribute. I like to do ministry. Like I like to, I like to feel like I'm contributing and giving back to the church. Yeah. Like, so, so we were involved in, and in through that process, we found things out that just really left us disillusioned because yeah. I was coming out of, I mean, when, when I came into that non-denominational church, the last church I was at before I became Orthodox, I was just coming out of new age and yeah. I was searching deep. We had come, me and my wife went to a very high dose, like 15 gram mushroom ceremony on native land. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I, I had this experience where I, I literally, I was kind of dis, I, I, I was so gone. It was like a disassociation state of being that I was in. And wow. I was having these, there was demonic voices in my head during this ceremony. And they were telling me I was going to forget. It was going to take the, the memory of my son away. I just started losing it. And it was telling me it was going to erase the memory of my son. And it told me, if you want to see your son again, or even have any recollection of him, you need to get up and jump in the fire right now. And I literally got up and I swanned up, like I howled at the moon or something. I don't really rem remember all of it. It was almost like I was watching it outside of myself. It was so crazy. Oh. And I swan dove into a fire and I just laid there like ready to die. And someone picked me up out of it. And, and I like brushed myself off and I was like, man, did, did that really happen? Like I'm on fire. I kind of came back into my being in that moment. The shock of the reality of I'm on fire. My stomach is burning, brought me back into my being and into that moment. And um, there was people trying to calm me down and I was doing like breathing exercises because I'm still kind of yoga out at the time. And that's oh, like my man. instinct. And yeah, I'm just it's just madness. And there's people trying to calm me down. And then there's also people like high on mushrooms that are trying to calm me down and not doing the best job. And there's like a conflict. <laughs> You're all like, and, so yeah. And I ended up, I ended up punching someone. I ended up punching someone shortly after that. So I jump in a fire, I punch someone, I break my hand. My hand's still wrecked to this day. At least I could write Lord have mercy. Oh, um, but yeah, that's it. That like, the, there's a lot more to it. There's a lot more that happened, but that's like the short kind of gist of, of, of like the, my dark place that I went to that I feel like almost everybody has to go to. Hopefully they don't have to do that. I, hopefully they can learn vicariously through my mistakes there. And don't jump in a fire on 15 grams of shrooms. Don't do the shrooms in the first place. Oh, Not good. It oh, opens you up to demonic influence. Oh, oh, and um, yeah, so I think there is this place that, that this dark place that a lot of us tend to go to. And the more people I talk to coming into orthodoxy, the more I see it, this, this dark place where you have to confront reality and 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 uh god's will and 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 our how how we it's not our will it's god's will and he has a plan that we really don't understand yet and um wow. coming to terms with all that really it yeah, shell shocked me and led me into orthodoxy to go from a church right so that's what i'm saying is so i'm i'm in this spot where i'm contending with my best friend we are he's a he's a teaching mentor i was an evangelistic mentor we're dumb hardcore kids surrounded by grownups, they should be doing a good job. And we are watching this through our like street eyes going, if, yeah. this, if this was on tour, this dude would have gotten beat up and left in a flying J. Why yeah. are you protecting women? What is the matter with you? And, and I was like, I'm on fire on the inside because I'm also in the grief of loss. And I'm watching a dude who I think is totally functioning demonically and i'm watching the church tolerate it because he's a good preacher and i'm like my babies are dying and you guys are playing games with demonic energy yeah and my question was ultimately because i i'm going so there's i'll go back in a second but yeah no in, worries you're good part, i'm looking at this and i go oh my god I've been following this culture because there are legitimate spiritual miracle. There's powerful spiritual reality in Christianity. I believe it. I've seen it. Yep. Yep. I'm watching this nightmare for the victims. The women have been totally affected and all the men are just trying to protect that podium because in that culture, this is my side thing. That podium is the most important thing. That podium is the Eucharist for the non-denominational world. 
exactly. that's the holy space, right? So that can't be messed up at all. Protect that exactly. at all costs because we don't have yeah. another option. If, yes. if, if the TED talk implodes, we are in big trouble. So I'm yeah. watching this happen and I'm thinking to myself, I need you guys to operate in the authority of Christ. My children are dying. I don't know if this dude's demons are killing my kids. Like I'm so terrified at what this world looks like. And you guys are playing church games. And my question was, where's the authority of Christ? And I, wow, I'm out. This is a game. I, yeah, that's why, that's where I went. I need to find out if the authority of Christ for real is real or I'm out. I've been rooting for the wrong thing, but personally I'm praying to Jesus. And this is, I'm saying this and you know, yeah, this I've is all powerful all over the world. And I've prayed for people and I've, I've got video testimony and I've prayed for people, me, goofy, me, sinner, me hands on someone prayed for them. Cancer gone. Blind eyes healed, deaf ears open. Like I've seen all of that. And now I'm going to Jesus. My babies are dying. The doctors are looking at us like we need to, we need to schedule an operation. And me and Chrissy are looking at them saying, no, you need to give us 72 hours. We're going to go home and pray. And God's going to answer. We go home and pray and like, it's going to mess me up. That happened a lot. That happened like multiple times. And so I'm going to the Lord that I know. And it was like, he was silent. And I'm looking at the Jesus that I'm, I'm coming to you the way you told me to. Right. Right. And it's like, it was like, and so I, I'm crying with my wife on the back porch after the second time, after we lose Phoebe. And I'm, I'm like, I'm, I know what's going to happen. And she said, what? And I said, I can't hear him. And he's like, not talking to me. He's going to be so nice to us. We're going to watch God be so kind to us everywhere. And it's not going to make up for how much pain I'm in. But I, it was almost like I knew he wasn't communicating with me. He, he wasn't talking to me the way that I, he, he, but I was like, we were in him. I couldn't get away from him, but I couldn't feel him. I couldn't, it was like, we were just like lost. It, I'm, but I'm like, we're in God. And I'm looking at Chrissy and I said, to her, because we're both looking like, what have we believed? We've seen so many miracles. Like we've seen, yeah. so many, we like, had what friend, was that? Right. We had a friend call yeah. us. His wife was pregnant with their son, has the same exact diagnosis that we had with ours. Hits everyone up in our group chat and is like, can you please pray for her? Because blah, blah, we pray her son's fine. Wow. We're just watching this. Like what is going on? Like these undeniable synchronicities that you just know. It's like, it's undeniable. Too many coincidences to be just a coincidence. It's not a coincidence. No. So I'm looking at Chris and I go, where are we going to go? And and I said to her and I, I I looked at her and I'm like, I don't understand. Like I, I literally, it's like, he is literally not talking to us, but like we're, we exist in him. And so it's like, I could feel like we were in this cloud of God, but it was not, it was not like nothing was working. And so I just remember looking at her and saying, um, and she's just sobbing. She said, she she said to me, I feel foolish for believing what I believe. And so then I'm crying. I know, I know that feeling thing of like, so I'm looking at her, I go, you made a covenant with him before you ever made one with me. And I made a covenant with him before I ever made one with you. And we're not going anywhere, but I have no idea what to do. And it was just months of us looking at one another and just crying on our back patio. Like what is happening? So my relationship with Jesus, it was like, it got washed. And then in the meantime, my connection to his people was just like, I'm like, I'm divorcing this culture. I want nothing to do. With yes. this, I, I need to find the authority of Christ. And the way I said it to Chrissy was I'm, I'm trying to find his eyes and I don't care if it makes me more religious. I've got to find him. Yeah. And that was in that journey of like, I don't care where he is. I, wherever he is, is where I'm going. Exactly. And, and so that's kind of what was going on in the grief, the grief of all that loss, but truly for me, even deeper spiritually in some ways was grieving the loss of the relationship with Jesus 
that I had and the identity that I had in him as a dude that knew how to pray and knew what yeah. to do. It's like, I, right. it, all, it all kind of died in that time. And so that was the morning and that was the, what do I believe? Where do I go? So when you talked about the fire and it's like, dude, I wasn't, I wasn't doped out like that, but it's like the, the idea of hitting a dark night and, Oh yeah, dude. Talk about dark night. Another thing that happened that night, the demon was telling me you're in, it was around the same time he was talking to, it was this voice telling me about the losing the memory of my son. It was going to wipe that clean. And it was saying the sun doesn't rise here. And while we were in this thing called this warm kiss ceremony, me and my wife looked up and we had this shared hallucination. I don't know if it was hallucination. Oh. I, it gets weird where the stars disappeared. We looked up, my wife said, look at the sky, are the stars gone? And we've been watching the stars all night leading into this ceremony. The ceremony started about 9 p.m., rolled into about 3 a.m. So we're looking up at the star and there's no stars. There's no clouds in the sky. The stars disappeared. Like they were so clear before and it's just pitch black. And, I, and then later on that evening, the, the demon's telling me, the sun doesn't rise here anymore. I remember telling that story to my priest. I was confessing to my priest right when I came in. I wanted him to know my history, my spiritual history of what, who I was and, and where I was coming from. And he was like, did he mean, did it mean the son or the son of God? And I was, and I, that didn't even hit me until right then. And I'm like, it could have been oh. both in that aspect, you know? And um, it was just, it blew my mind. And, and it, and it, and it literally, we got out of there. We forced our, we fought our way out of there pretty much. And um, drove, we're driving home barefoot because we were barefoot in the ceremony and we had like all our stuff, kind of our belongings left. We just left the stuff. We're like, we're getting out of here. I was like, we got to go, dude. We got to get the heck out of here because we're going to like, I don't know. I just felt this spirit of like sacrifice in there. I'm not saying they planned on sacrificing us, but I, I could feel the energy of this is how it happened back in the day. Like this is how you get these crazy ideas in your head. And they seem like, aha, powerful like uh these these great ideas in the moment they seem so revolutionary and 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 they hit you in a different way when you're in that state of being and they seem really good and i could just feel that spirit in the air i could feel it in the air i'm like this is how it happens we could die tonight and um we we started driving home and we're driving home and it's just these windy pitch black roads and everything looks the same and we're in this like acid loop or whatever you want to call it and everything's like looping and we're in hell i'm literally in hell like i could feel it like i was put in hell and it was just this, like, this eternal darkness like this eternal this night of the soul whatever you want but it was it felt permanent it felt very permanent and we're trying to drive out and my wife's saying are we just going in circles are we getting anywhere and i'm looking at the cell phone i'm like no we're go. i could see the cell phone we're getting closer to home and I can tell you, man, the feeling of when we were getting driving back into San Diego and seeing the sun rise was so powerful. It was like it's over. Like, and I was I called my 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 kids, and I was coming back to see my kids, and I was so happy to see my kids, and and just the sun rising. I knew it was over once the sun rose. I was like, I could tell it was weird. It was almost like the the, the demons don't have as much power in this, in this, uh, oh gosh, in this bro. place right here. It was so, it, it was crazy. What you, what we put ourselves through. <laughs> right. Holy I was trying to find God. I was trying to find God bro. the whole time. I was genuinely trying to find God out there. Even in the womp kids taking those mushrooms. I thought I was, I thought I was still doing Christ's will. I thought I genuinely thought that I thought I could blend all these things. I thought, you know, and I thought wrong and God really just smacked me right out of that. And, Dude. um, <laughs> <laughs> right after that, right after that, I found Church of the Church of the Eternal Logos. Like it was like it was dropped on my lap as like a gift by God's providence. And I and I came into Orthodoxy and just started researching deeper and found an Antiochian parish parish near me and um went and I, I knew instantly this is home. This is where I've been this is what I've been looking for my entire life. Did it and it encompassed I'm saying this even as an a dude it's on the journey, right? Like we we so it was the it was the movement. It was the tradition. It was the imagery. It was it, it was everything. It's the holistic aspect. It's the I, I remember before I would come from Protestantism, they would and there, there would be fights about faith versus works. And I come into orthodoxy. It's faith and works. These are inseparable. Look at the book of James. And I'm like, oh, that's what I thought. Oh, okay. That's how we That's how we yeah. live. Else. Right. Right. Yeah, sure. Okay. It's like I can't we can't separate these things and pit them against each other. And it's not, it's not either it's it's both and mm -hmm. you know and it's and it's 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 always both and in orthodoxy when it comes to these like just the holistic understanding of 
of the iconography, the church history, just the beauty and all these different aspects, the incense, the frankincense and myrrh and all these things and how they connect back to the practices that Jesus taught us, that Christ was doing with the apostles and the, and the book of Acts and, and the Christians were first called Christians in Antioch and all this. And then you come back to the Bible, you connect it all. And it's like all these things connect so beautifully. Wow. And, mm -hmm. and it's just it's really powerful when you're when you're coming into that and you see all these things connect and you're and you're kind of living it. And uh, that's super cool, man. I, I think in general, for me, there's another couple of people I've talked to that have a similar background where they were they were really, really deep in. And it's a spirituality, you know what I mean? It's like they were very, very deep into new age spirituality as a means yeah. into transcendence. And it's wild to me that such high church, high religious practice, like holy orthodoxy. I mean, it's like, it's high level church. And I feel like for the longest time we thought, dude, get all that stuff out. And like, we don't want to, it's like, it's gotta be this like, I don't know. Other thing, it's wild to me to have some of these conversations and realize that there's so many people in the world that are like, I really, I responding to all of these things. Like we needed all of it. And I, yeah, no, and I, I needed all those steps along the way. Yeah. I needed, I needed all those to get to where I'm at a hundred percent. And that's real for you. Like even for me back, I just, it's for me, I've been sober forever. So I haven't, I haven't done, um, I went to Burning Man, right? And it's like people go for either a spiritual experience or a sexual encounter. That's one or two. And right, so we, right. We're in the spiritual bubble. And like, even with real wild stuff happening, Chrissy Green and me both were looking at each other and like we were in this bubble of like grace. Like it, it wasn't yeah. occurring to us as um, crappy or we, we just were looking. I mean, I'm sitting across doing a dream interpretation from fully naked people and just. Right. Being, so what was the dream? And I just, it was like, we were safe. So I don't yeah. I didn't have that experience. I was just in the and, and sobriety. Sobriety is a big part of that. Being sober is a big part of, of keeping your faculties because like when you, when you, those all, I think all drugs in a certain aspect, open you up to demonic influence, some at higher levels, especially hallucinogens and um, demonic delusion, especially if you're in a delusional state of being demonic delusions can bleed into your reality really quick. I mean, it's kind of simple, but it's like, you know, Sometimes it isn't when you're in it. Yeah, man. But well, I just have yeah. friends that are that are beginning to embrace more and more, probably just that like the the um, micro dosing some of these things, like you know, trying to heal trauma, like it affects. Right, yeah. So I'm yeah. watching the culture, and I I don't I just resolved when I, I think I was like 15 and a half that I was just going to be sober forever. So some of the more like spiritual stuff like that, I just I missed it. It's not my thing, and I'm yeah. thinking that new age people are going to be completely repulsed by blah. But the reality is, is the more that I see the face of the church kind of change and people beginning to venture into Holy Orthodoxy, I just, I feel, especially my homie that I was saying, Aaron, that became, he was a yoga teacher for years and years and years. And so like, he's like, no man, like I love Vespers because of the chanting. Like I, I like hearing all the sounds, like all like, there's this, it's very interesting. It allows Christianity to be the Eastern religion that it is. And I yes, think, yes, yes, yes. Like, I think there's something about that in the heart of a lot of people where they're like, please show me something like authentic that is bigger than what I could just do on my own. Um, yeah. I, I don't know. Anyways, that's really, I feel encouraged that you have your background and yet coming from such a free and open place that you chose to follow Christ in this way. Like that's, it's wild to me. I feel like really encouraged by that. That seems cool. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, uh, I need those boundaries. I need those parameters because I mean, if I don't have them, I may end up in a fire and punch <laughs> someone. <laughs> it's like, you know what I mean? So it's like, I need this like super intense discipline, but not, but it's also, it's not like Calvinism. It's like, there's, there's this appeal. There's this, there's this thing of people coming from like Eastern mysticism, like Hinduism and all these things. And it's like, I was everything I was I was looking for, everything I was looking for in Hinduism was like I was finding a false version of what I found in in in, in orthodoxy was like the fullness of it. Wow. The orthodoxy was the fullness of what I was looking for and I went to Hinduism because I was disillusioned with western Christianity with yeah. the lack of like the de the spiritual depth. So yeah. I couldn't find that there so I go and I find I I'm looking for it in in Hinduism and I think I'm finding it and I am finding something spiritually deep but it's 
in my opinion, it's demonic for what I found. It's real and it's spiritual, but it's not of God. Wow. It's of the wow. evil one. And then repelling back and saying, oh, I found the evil one. So what's on the other side of that? Christ. And then kind of coming That's into orthodoxy through through power. that. It's like this it's like this ping pong kind of thing almost like mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of people that are on that journey. I guess I I was talking with a friend today, um, Father Christopher Foley. He's in North Carolina. He uh, he was in a, a really good band, a kind of indie rock band. He still is. They've been doing it for like 30 years called Luxury. And um, oh, I just they have a documentary that came out. If I'm not mistaken, dude, I saw that. Me and my a couple other of my buddies from the church were talking about that just the other day. Really cool documentary. Yeah, awesome music too. Yeah, they're really good. And he so he yeah. called me. Um, Holy Name did its uh, live stream. He, we filmed it, and my friend Joe, who's in a hardcore, Christian hardcore band called Advent, he was like, "Hey man, can my friend uh, uh, call you?" And I said, "Yeah." And he said he was a he's a priest. He's an, he's an Orthodox priest. Um, and I was like, "Oh, that's tight." He's like, he was in that band Luxury on Tooth and Nail. And I was like, "No," because yeah, like three of those dudes are priests now. And I was like, "Shit!" Yeah. So yeah, I mean, we just talked. He it was more like personal, you know, like how am I doing and what's the journey like and what am I, you know, that, and so it's really cool. So he called me today cause he was on a podcast, uh, um, haunted by Eden was the title of the podcast. It was really, Oh, really that's great. an interesting title Dude, for a podcast. So, I'll text it to you. Um, yeah, he was, he was just really great. So we were talking about that earlier, uh, today, but, um, when you say that I, we were having a conversation earlier and I just said, I'm, I'm intrigued to see what is going to, what is going to take place and let's just call it like a short wave of interest like let not make anything bigger than it is i hope it's really awesome for tons and tons of people but there's this renewed interest in in orthodoxy it just seems to be hitting all like people like me people like but so i'm really intrigued to see how a whole group of people where the information can spread as fast as it can what that's going to look like within yeah church in america because it's it's all weirdos like it's all of us <laughs> yeah yeah having to like unlearn you know you know what it kind of you know what it kind of reminds me of it's like um i don't know that's i see a lot of the weirdos thriving now like having not all the answers but like almost like the last will be first and the first will be last like i see all the weirdos like the people with street smarts i feel i see my like i used to sell weed i used to sell all this stuff and it's like i feel like i, I a lot of the stuff i learned on the streets are coming into helping me with my discernment with like spiritual discernment it's like i was developing discernment through street smarts and like i mean i was making a lot of mistakes out there too but it's like I just see these 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 uh, characteristics being very important to 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 leading me in uh, deeper into this spiritual life and um and helping me with my discernment and uh, I think I don't know there's something to that I don't know I just, if I articu articulated that right but uh, there's something to that for sure I'm like I'm I'm open handed I've been talking with some of the my mentors in that and just going what do you think it's gonna look like because it's it's not strictly cultural like you know what I mean it's it's this weird blend of the last last big evangelical wave of all these people becoming dissatisfied with the the lack like what is that going to look like when tens of thousands of people that have a christian background discover this this pearl and this beautiful gem yeah like i mean that is wild is it and that like so it's this very interesting conversation but i just feel like what <laughs> What is God doing? Like we were just my 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 um spiritual father, my priest. He just had a converse like his his last homily on Sunday was was about. I mean, we're seeing all these people, these young men coming into the to the Orthodox Church, but this is just the beginning. Like there's about to be like a crazy influx. So you could that? feel, yeah, you could just you could, and wow. I could feel it too. I could feel it. I could see it coming. In and he's he's at, he's talking about how he's going to need help. You know, just kind of like and he's talking about all these people coming from hallucinogenic backgrounds backgrounds with hallucinogens with yoga with hinduism and just like everything we're talking about right now kind wow. of and it was just it was really powerful just to hear him breaking that down and, and just kind of thinking about where that's where is that going to go and what is that going to look like and it's like we don't really know but it's it's kind of cool to ponder on in the and moment like, you know <laughs> I, I feel a bit like um yeah that's really cool that he would say because i just feel like you know I, I swear I can just feel it in my gut. Like, no, like there's a wave that's going to, because 
it's not, it's not the Orthodox church isn't like needy and like, it, I don't know, man. It's like, it's not a taker. Like, so yeah. I feel like yeah. there's this generosity of, of wisdom and, and history and beauty. And it's like, I feel like it, people are, it's just too attractive. And so I don't, it just blows my mind. Where I'm like, man, what is that going to be? So that's the stuff that keeps me up. Cause I'm just like, I don't know how it all works, but if there's like a couple thousand more people like me, that is going to be wild. And then I think about a couple more thousand people like a Mark. Yeah. Right. That's going to be pretty wild too. And we're not, <laughs> I'm not Greek. Like I'm not. Yeah, I'm no, not, exactly. I'm, yeah. This no, I have, I have no like uh, ethnic connection to the, really like it's not it doesn't have you don't have to be Russian to be Russian part of the Russian Orthodox Church. You don't have to be Greek to be part of the Greek Orthodox Church. And the beauty of Antiochian Orthodox is it's like it's all over the place. So it's like in either way, it's like you'll find you can find Greek. You can find tons of Greek parishes where they'll embrace you regardless of if you're Greek or not. And and it's just about getting in there and talking to the priest in person. I think a lot of people, they have like this kind of idea of like, oh, this is only for this. And, and they're going to be judgmental. They're going to be extra strict. And when you get in there, it's the complete opposite. I've never been in a less judgmental community than the Orthodox community that I've found. Antio the Antiochian Orthodox uh, church parish that I'm attending. It's such a beautiful community and the way that everyone works together to serve each other at Agape. We wow. have Agape meals afterwards. And it's just... I've never seen, it's definitely not a taker. I mean, like it, it doesn't take anything. I get free meals after liturgy. I mean, come for a free meal. If you, if you, if that, if that's all you want, you're going to get a lot more than a free meal. You're going to get fed with something much, much deeper and spiritual in your soul. But if that's what you want to come for, if that's what gets you to come, come on down and have some, some uh, agape with us, you know? Gosh, that's so crazy. That's yeah. beautiful. I, yeah. That's, that's really, really cool, Mark. That's awesome, man. I wanted to ask like a, just a couple more questions and then we'll, I think we'll wrap it up from here. This has been such a, such an awesome talk. I really appreciate you coming on Tommy. I'm sorry, dude. It's like a, it's, it's over an hour. I'm sorry. I just, Oh no, 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 no. I just, okay. I, this is great. This is great. I love it. It's just like, you're getting so deep and um, there's so much to get into. It's like, I mean, especially when you start talking orthodoxy, you can really go forever if you don't ever, if you don't put a stop to it, it could go on and on because the depth is endless. There's endless depth to it. Two more questions. All right, let's go. Let's get it. Yes. We'll All right, let's it. do it. Let's do it. Um, let's see. Let's see. Oh, yeah, yeah let's, we'll switch it up a little bit. What are your main musical influences? Who did you listen to growing up? Well, because my, my mom and my stepdad were um, like, you know, Southern Baptist people in the 80s, like music was like a no-no. So right, I, right. Secular not, music was a no-no. Dude, I was not, a, and my stepdad was the youth pastor. So like, there was just even that. So I, I hid music. <laughs> right. <laughs> so um, it started when I was younger, up till probably fourth or fifth grade. It was all hip hop. It was just nice. Like, Love it. I grew up on Wu Tang Clan, so I could, I could, I, didn't I could dig that. Clan until probably seventh or eighth grade. That was like 93, 93. But, but I, I, for me, it was uh, um, Slick Rick and NWA and nice. Heavy Duty Boys and Two Live Crew. And, but it, that was like so foul. Like I had to like hide that. Yeah. So I didn't rap for a while. And then when I was in about fifth grade, um, I started hearing bands uh, that were playing punk rock and like grunge rock. I'd moved to Washington State with my mom and my stepdad took a job okay. at a church there when I was in um, fifth grade. And so that was when I first started hearing bands that played their own music. And I remember being like, yo, I want to do that. And so it right. was Dead Kennedys and Nirvana and nice. uh, uh, Crass. And there was just, it was like punk rock bands and then radio bands. Cause it was also Seattle. Right. Yeah, as, right. I was like going. So I was like, I want to play drums. And so, I got into I got into all the music in like fifth grade and then through kind of um, the rest of elementary into junior high in Washington at that point with the grunge rock kind of scene, you listen to everything like classic rock to like hard rock and punk and like hardcore, like everything. And so Heck it was yeah. it was a smorgasbord. So I just grew up listening to everything. I think uh, when I got into maybe ninth or tenth grade is when I started getting into like heavier music. Um, and that would have been like um helmet and pantera and uh deftones and like just kind of these like hardcore adjacent bands 
Um, and then, you know, that was just kind of like all there. And then by the time I got to Salt Lake, I was in 10th grade and I was still in the punk rock scene. So I was playing drums in punk bands. Um, nice. And then I started listening more and more to uh, hardcore bands from all over the place. And that was like, like hardcore punk bands. Like, you know, I was a punk rocker. So it started with like, you know, um, SOA, a minor threat and like DC hardcore bands, bad brains and stuff. And that was fast. Oh, bad brains. I love bad brains, dude. And then nice. I got into um, more metal kind of stuff. And that was just bands in the mid nineties that were like, you know, earth crisis and bloodlet and integrity and, refused gotcha. and all that. so anyway so it just kind of went that way and then i was just kind of in the hardcore scene at that point um playing nice. and singing and stuff like that so main influences were hip-hop until junior high kind of elementary school junior high and then it was punk rock and hardcore and then that was now it's everything most of everything so very cool very cool yeah the first music i ever heard any type of music that i really sat down and listened to was uh Wu-Tang Clan, the 36 Chambers, when I was like eight years old. So that was like intense. I'm like oh, listening to awesome. <laughs> Raekwon it's talking about... Good record. It's an incredible yeah. record. It's so good. The production by RZA, and it's so simple, yet so just timeless. And like, oh, man, that 1993 was such a golden age for hip-hop. Like, I mean, oh, my goodness. It was, it was insane. insane. It was you know, insane. and like, I mean, I mean, I grew up on that. I grew up on De La Soul, Three Feet High and Rising, oh. you know. Far yes. side, bizarre ride to the far bizarre side. Ride. There you, go. you know, like yes. all that, and that was that was cool to see uh, the West Coast kind of kind of doing a hip hop thing from L.A. I was like, and just really kind of like put doing their own thing. I was like, wow, that's powerful. And it sounds yeah. like East Coast, but they're doing their own thing. Kind of, it was like Tribe Called Quest, of course. Tribe. So yeah, I mean, the Roots. I grew up on all that stuff. So yes, yeah, but love love hip hop. Big hip hop head. So that's awesome. very cool. Very uh, cool. Yeah, that's been cool. That's my so influences were hip hop, like everybody, and then punk rock, and then hardcore, like the hardcore scene. We joke about we just say that it's hip hop for punk rock kids, because right, same thing. So that's kind of like where I landed was the blend of all of it. So that makes sense. Okay, last question. Let's see. Okay. Um, when did you know that orthodoxy was the truth? Was there like a moment where it was like solidified? Was there an exact moment where you're like, this is it? I know I'm at the right place. Or are you still possibly in the, in the process? I'm, I'm in the process, but I would say the thing that set me on my heels, like, Oh, and me and Chrissy both, like I'm in the catechesis or the catechism class at Trinity. Chrissy's watching it at home with our kids. And we're talking through all the sacraments. And father Patrick said, what's interesting is, um, that Christ established the Eucharist and the church was built around that. The, yeah, like Christ yeah. formed the Eucharist and the church formed around that. And exactly. I went, oh no. Like I just, it was just like, yeah, yeah. Cause then you see, cause then you're thinking about what the churches that you, that you were familiar with, what they were formed around that podium and the, and the cult of personality. And then kind of like, Oh, that right. That just, aha was, moment so powerful because I went home and Chrissy and me looked at each other like, well, we got to slow down. Like, this is a big deal. Like it, it literally felt like, Oh, th that's why like that chalice is a big deal. That's the center of like creation on a Sunday. Like that's like, Whoa. And so that slowed us down. Cause there was, we were like, all right, like doing the class when I talked to father Patrick and like, you know, and, and all of a sudden it was just like, we had to we had to like get our heads around how incredibly important that that what that is that is worship everything yeah. else is awesome but it's like that there's a truth there and and we were like oh okay like that that's a way bigger deal this is not like a you can't play like this isn't a play thing at all this is yeah yeah to me i guess it it went from I'm exploring and I'm really trying to figure this out and I'm just trying to find a place to rest my heart. And like, I want to, I want to follow the Lord for real, you know, and it was, it was sort of cagey and like whatever. And then I think when, when that, when that was put in front of me, I knew it was important and I knew that it was by initiation almost only like it, it's, it's a holy thing. But when he said that, it felt like, 
this is what separates the, this is what separates the church that I've known from any other religion on the planet. This is very interesting. And I it literally like I had to like I like like oh. yeah. And and we really like we took weeks cuz we were just thinking like we're learning and growing and this is awesome and just the process of going through that especially for Chrissy like she was healing in her heart around the stuff with the Lord. I was healing from my relationship with the church. So right. we had different mm. we had different pain points and mm. and studying holy orthodoxy together kind of getting on the same kind of page and going like yeah like we'll go again like it was it, I was there first and in a lot of ways I've just been sort of leading that direction but for Chrissy I think she's she said it's filled in all of these gaps that she had in her understanding. So it's just been interesting. Yeah. It's like, we're going slow, but yeah. that to me, I went, no, that, that right there is a standard for history, for the presence of God, for the truth of the church's existence for 2000 years. That's the thing that's yeah. the thing right there. Like, well, I still am dealing with it is why I say like, I'm still in the journey. I'm walking towards it, but I'm like, yeah, whoa, like it's a so process. It's a, it's a long process. And I, I mean, it's a, it, it was a long process for me personally. You know, oh, I was in between, I, I was in between two worlds for like a year, maybe. Oh yeah. Yeah. Sure. For about, or maybe even two years. It was, I, I, it's hard to put my finger on like, because I was like looking into it and the seeds planted. And then it's like, and then I'm really trying to like move in that direction. And then it's like, but then I have maybe someone else who wants to go in another direction and I'm trying to not push people around me too hard. I'm trying to, because I was like, try not to be too forceful, but also I was like, I know this is where I need to be. Like inside of me, I'm like, I need to be here. This is the truth. Wow. And then yeah. it's like, and then it's like, but then not wanting to push other people away and let them find it on their own. Because if it's a, it's always more powerful when they find the truth on, in their own time and on their own accord, Absolutely. than if it's me shoving it down their throat. You know, and I know that's true for me as well. And that's how I, I found orthodoxy. I mean, through Christ, I mean, but it felt like it dropped on my lap, like a magical, I mean, it was just so profound the way it happened. And I remember the moment I knew it was, it was the truth. It was uh, last Pascha. It was last Holy Week. It was on Holy Saturday. And I was attending that late night service with my wife and we were both standing next to each other. And it was the Lamentations of the Theotokos. Mm -hmm. And she's watching her son die on the cross. And it was like, it brought us to tears. It's almost making me choke up right now a little bit. Mm -hmm. And it, and it, it's, I was, I looked over and my wife was crying and I was crying and it was, it was just like, I'd never experienced the death of Christ on the cross through the eyes of his own mother, through the eyes of the Theotokos. And that, wow. that moment right there solidified orthodoxy. Wow. Sorry, I'm getting a little choked up. <laughs> That's beautiful. That's so awesome. I mean, what a powerful yeah. moment. Hey, at least you were aware of it. Like that's yeah. so cool. Like, and you guys have that. Like, you have that memory. That's yeah. So, so cool. I'm really, I'm really looking forward to Pascha this year and and um, Holy Week this year. And uh, this is our first like uh, Lent as baptized Orthodox Christians. So it's been an interesting journey. It's been a struggle, yeah. but you know, a glory to God for every struggle because it's it's only bringing me closer and closer into that path, that walk of theosis. And I need, I need a lot of help. So yeah, man, we all do. We all do. Man, that's beautiful. So yeah, that's what I'd say is I, I think I feel, I feel very, I think I believe, but I, I don't, I don't know that I know yet. And I feel like that comes in the walk that comes in the journey. And so I'm like, yeah, I think so. So I would just say, it's like the thing that really struck me and I've had to like, I had to stop and actually deal with it. And to me that says truth. Like there's a, there's yes. a, there's a boulder in your little. Yeah, river it's, it's like, it's like this, this immovable objective truth and it makes you stop and adapt to it. And you, yeah. and it cannot I, never adapt to you. It's not going to move to me. I got to, yeah. so that's what I'd say is like, oh, the no thing. Yeah. I didn't even know if I wanted to know it, but that happened. And I went, oh, okay. And we had to sit, we sat and talked for a long time. I came home and I was like, yo, that was, she, and Chrissy's like, that was, it's kind of scary. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> so, was talking it through. You know, so, um, but that's what I'd say is, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I believe, right. I, I believe. Yeah. That, help help my own belief man like I, i'm just walking it out so glory to god man no that's that's powerful and that's true man and that's and it's honest and that's i i love it dude i love hearing people's testimonies coming yeah. to to orthodoxy it's such a there's so many powerful testimonies of people 
come into the faith. I talk with these people at Agape and I'm like, this is just, it's beautiful. It's beautiful wow. to see. And, and your, your testimony is no, no exception to that. I mean, it's really powerful. And I think it's going to read, I think this, these kind of talks are going to reach a lot of people that may not have been as open to something like orthodoxy and through music that you're making with like yeah. holy name and, and everything you're doing. It's just, I think it opens up orthodoxy to a whole new group of people. And I think that's a beautiful thing. And I think it's just, it's, it's, it's so beautiful, man. That's so awesome. beautiful. Well, okay. So where are you at again? Cause I'm going to come out, I'm coming out there uh, yeah. later this year, but where yeah. Are you, where are you at? I'm, I'm attending. My church is uh St. Anthony's Antiochian Orthodox parish. So that's where I'm attending church. And I'm in San Diego. I'm in El Cajon, El Cajon, San Diego, California, pretty much. All right. I'm going to message you when we come out to California. Then. Yeah, Let's definitely do that, brother. I would love to link up with you and, and just uh, talk in person. And yeah. That'd be great. Thank you, Mark. I really appreciate it, man. Thanks for having me on your podcast. Dude, thank you so much, Tommy, for coming on. It was a great talk. I think this is probably one of the most powerful uh, episodes we've had so far. So thank you so much. Thank you. It was really, really awesome talking to you, brother. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, I think we're going to wrap it up. Thanks, Thanks. everybody, for watching. Uh, if you guys like this, go ahead and give it a like. Maybe leave a comment below what you guys thought, you know, and um, any any guests you might got, you guys want to see in the future, go ahead and suggest them below, and uh, we'll see if that works out. Thank you so much, and God bless, everybody.